Hello, my name is Jeff Messier. I'm a professor in electrical and computer engineering in the Schulich School of Engineering. And this is module 17 in my computer networks lecture series, where I talk about how, or where I talk about the relationship between multi-hop mesh networks and the size of the packets that we send through those networks. And so just as a, a little bit of a, um, a correction, at the end of the previous module, I said we were going to be talking about hierarchical addressing. We are going to, but that's going to be in module 18. So this is just a little bit of a detour that I, I wanted to fit in. So the in this discussion and in discussions to follow, you'll often hear me refer to the term network hop. And so a hop in a mesh network is basically refers to a single direct connection between two nodes. And we often say, you know, how many hops are there along a, a mesh network path? And we basically determine the number of hops by counting the number of direct connections along that path. And so just as a very simple example, if we have a source node communicating to a destination node through a single intermediate router, we would say that this is a two hop network. So this is the first hop and that is the second hop. Now, as it turns out, the number of hops we have in our network affects what we should choose for the size of our packets that we send through the network, or at least there's, there's a relationship between, between the two. And this is something that comes up quite a lot. We, we saw it when we were looking at ARQ, for example, we saw that there was um, sort of a, an optimal packet size that, you know, gave you good efficiency for your ARQ scheme, but didn't, you know, expose you to um, too many retransmissions due to errors. And there's also, as it turns out, kind of an optimal packet size when we look at you know, sending the packet through the number of hop or through a, a mesh network with several hops. And this is often comes up as one of the more, or one of the interesting things about provisioning and designing networks. You know, even once your network is finished, there's a lot of parameters that you can set. And, you know, packet size is, is definitely one of those parameters. And so to kind of illustrate what I'm talking about, we're going to do some examples where we consider basically three scenarios. In each of these scenarios, we have a total of ND data bits to transfer. So you can think of like, you can think of it as being a big file, maybe a music file or a movie or something like that with ND bits, data bits in total. And we're going to consider three scenarios where we have a multi-hop mesh network where we send um, data from a source to a destination through two intermediate router nodes. So this would be a three hop network. And the first scenario we consider is kind of a historical sort of throwback scenario. It doesn't really exist on the internet, but I'm going to call this the circuit switched scenario where each of these routers is actually an old style telephone switch that switches in a hard copper wire connection between the source and the destination. And so the source and the destination essentially have an unbroken electrical connection that they can use to send data. And they use this connection to just send the whole file, all ND data bits all at once. The second scenario is one where we are using our routers as normal, except we send rather than, except that we send the whole file all at once. So the source takes the massive amount of data and sends the whole file all the way to the first router. The router then sends the whole file to the second router. And then the, that router sends the whole file to the destination. 
In the third scenario, we assume that before the data is sent, it's actually chopped into several smaller packets, and these packets are sent uh, separately and then reassembled at the destination. One of the key assumptions that we're going to make, which is you know generally true, is that any time a packet of data is received by a router, it has to be CRC checked before it is sent on along the next hop in the, the multi-hop path. So we don't just sort of send data through our routers without checking the data. There's always a CRC check performed. And if the CRC check fails, the packet or the data file is just dropped at that router and it's not forwarded on. And that's to prevent bad data from just kind of circulating around the internet that has no practical use. But as we're going to see, this business of needing to check our CRC before we send on the data is really kind of the mechanism that um, establishes a relationship between the number of hops in our network and how big a, uh, a packet size we should be using. Okay, so let's start by introducing some notation. So first of all, let's use the letter L to represent the number of hops in our network which for the purposes of this example is going to be equal to three. Tau is equal to the propagation delay of the signal traveling across each direct, the direct connections between each nodes, between <laughs> tau is equal to propagation delay, which is equal to the time it takes for the signal to travel between two nodes. And D, as we've already seen, is the number of data bits that we're sending. And O is the number of overhead bits per frame. And R is the data rate or the throughput of each of our links. Which of course is in bits per second. And so let's consider our first scenario, which is our circuit switched scenario. And in this, uh, in, this, in this diagram, I've shown four timelines. So the, each of these are versus time. And I'm gonna basically show how data moves between, I'm gonna use these timelines to show how data moves between each of these nodes. And it's gonna be kind of similar to the ARQ timelines that we were working through earlier on in the lecture series. And so I'm going to represent the first bit sent by the, the source to the router as a arrow. And the time it takes for the arrow to arrive at the source this represents the propagation delay tau. If that's the first bit, I'm also going to add a second arrow that represents the final bit of transmission. And the duration or the, the time between each of these arrows 
is basically the time it takes to transmit our whole message. And in this first circuit switch scenario, we're sending the whole data file. And we'll also assume that we've added overhead bits to that data file. So that means that this duration is equal to the number of data bits plus the number of overhead bits divided by the data rate. Now, as soon because this is a circuit switched situation, the router doesn't actually do anything with the bits that it receives. It basically just passes straight through the router on a dedicated electrical connection. And so the data, the first, that first data bit, as soon as it's received by the router, just basically is sent directly on to the second router. So there's nothing, you know, nothing that happens in that router. Same thing with the final data bit. And so, and then at the second router, that router again, just passes the, the information straight through. And so at the receiver, at the destination, we get our very first bit arriving at time L times tau, basically. So the, we just have to wait for three times the propagation delay between nodes because we've got three hops. And that's when our, our first bit arrives. And our final bit arrives at L tau plus in D plus N naught over R, which is just a single frame duration. Now, the reason why I wanted to include a circuit switched example is to demonstrate the advantages of a circuit switched network. Even though we don't use circuit switch technology anymore, there were some pretty nice things about having a dedicated electrical connection between two nodes that were communicating, and that is speed. A circuit switched, you can't beat a circuit switched network for speed. If you can electrically switch in a dedicated circuit between your source and your destination, that's always going to be faster than a multi hop network with routers for a fixed data rate. And I'll explain why that is when we look at the next scenario, which is using routers for the transferring the entire file in one big chunk. So our second scenario is where we use the intermediate routers. So we're back to having a, a mesh network again, but we don't bother with packets. Basically, we just take the whole big music file or movie, whatever we're sending, and transfer it all in one big chunk. And so the first part of our transfer between the source and the first router is looks, <clears throat> excuse me, exactly the same as for our circuit switched situation. So we have our first, oops, we have our first bit arriving at the router after tau seconds, which is the propagation delay. And then we have our final bit arriving at tau plus the duration of the frame, which is equal to nd plus n naught divided by the data rate. Where things get a little bit different though, is when we think about the CRC check. So this router is not going to send on its data until it can confirm that the data has been received correctly. And in order to do a CRC check, we know that 
the receiver needs to operate on the entire file. And so the router has to wait until it receives the entire data file before it can CRC check it and know that it's good to send on to the second um, router. And so the first data bit can only be sent by the router after the final data bit has been received. And then we have to, or then we can draw a second arrow. Whoops. To represent the, the final data bit. So basically the router, uh, the first router has to wait for the entire file to be received before it can start to transmit <clears throat> the file to the second router. The second router also has to wait for the entire file to be received so it can do its data check. And the file then is finally sent to the destination. And so you can see by looking at this picture that the, um, the delivery time is considerably later than the circuit switch situation. So if we look at when the final data bit arrives, the delivery time is actually equal to L times tau plus ND over N naught divided by R. And so the effect of including the routers now is that the L term doesn't multiply just the propagation delay, but it also multiplies the frame time. And again, the this considerable extra delay is as is a result of the fact that the each of the intermediate routers have to receive the whole file in order to do the CRC check before starting to transmit uh, even the very first bit of that file along the next hop in the path. So how do we do better? Well. It turns out that we can improve our delivery time in a multi-hop network by simply dividing the data file into packets. And so in this picture, I've shown basically the, the, full, um, the full file, you know, the first arrow showing the first bit in the file and the second arrow showing the last bit in the file. But let's now chop this file into packets. So. Let's, you know, for the sake of the diagram anyways, divide the file into three packets. And so each of these arrows represent the, um, so the first arrow represents the first bit in the first packet. The second arrow represents the last bit in the first back packet and the first bit in the second packet. This arrow represents the final bit in the second packet and the first bit in the third. And this arrow represents the final bit in the third packet. And so the advantage of dividing the bits into, or the, the file into packets, is that the CRC check can now be done on a packet by packet basis. And so once we receive this first packet, the router can CRC check it. And if it checks out, it can start to send that packet along the next hop while simultaneously receiving the second packet. And so we get something that looks like this. So we receive the first packet, we CRC check it, and then Whoops. We can start sending it. So if this is the first packet, the second packet, and the third packet, the router can start to send the first packet along the second hop while it's receiving the second packet. Start to send the first packet along the second hop while it receives the second packet. And by a similar by a similar token, 
once it receives the second packet, it can start to send the second packet along while it receives the third packet. And so just to kind of give you the complete picture, we end up with something that looks like, oops. with a picture that looks like this. So um, I'll just change my color here. We receive the first packet, then we send the first while we receive the second, and then the second router is able to send the first to the destination while it receives the second, while the first router is still receiving the third. And so we basically have parallel transmission possible. And it makes the delivery time of our packet look a lot, or the delivery time of our data look a lot more like the circuit switch scenario. So remember the circuit switch scenario represents the ideal case. If we were, if we had a circuit switch network, basically this green line would represent the arrival of the first bit and this second green line would represent the arrival of the last bit. Now, when we had, when we were transmitting the whole file from router to router, we didn't receive anything until like way out here. But as you can see, basically what using packets achieve is sort of taking this really sort of late delivery that we had out here and pulling it more towards the ideal case of where we receive our data if we had a true circuit switch network. So basically chopping our data into packets is allowing our multi-hop network to look a little bit more like a circuit switch network in terms of delivering the data as fast as possible. So just to put some, some numbers around this or some equations around it, um, the number of packets so the variable k, oops, I won't put it over there. Sorry about that. The variable k is equal to the number of packets. And let's let um, np represent the number of bits per packet, which is equal to and O, the overhead bits, plus the number of data bits divided by K, right? So every packet always has a fixed number of overhead bits, but the number of information bits is divided by the number of packets that we have. And so the arrival of our first packet, like the, the arrival and the successful CRC check of our first packet occurs at a time equal to the number of hops times the propagation delay plus the number of bits per packet divided by R. Our final delivery time of like the last packet in our, in our message or in our file is equal to L tau plus NP over R plus the number of packets minus one times basically the time it takes to send a packet. So that's our, our final, um, or that, that's the point in time where we receive and CRC verify the final bit in our message. However, you'll note that, you know, once we receive our first packet and CRC check it, and if it checks out okay, there's no reason why we can't start sending data up the protocol stack. So for example, if we're streaming a movie, we don't have to wait to download the whole movie. And of course we know from watching uh, streaming services that that's typically not what happens. That's typically not what happens. We, we sort of receive and buffer a little bit and then we start to play as we receive data. And so this packets allow us to do that. So to conclude, let's consider a bit of an example just to show how, you know, the packet size or the number of, you know, pieces that we chop our file into 
affects the delivery time of our user data. So let's consider an example where we take some kind of typical numbers. So the average website back in 2011, this is examples a little bit old now, but back in 2011 was about a megabyte. So that's, so the number of data bits in our entire file that we're transferring, in this case, it's a website, is equal to 7,905,280 bits when we convert this just into number of bits. The overhead in um, IP version four packet is 20 bytes. So the number of overhead bits is 160 bits. Let's assume 100 megabits per second for our data rate. Our propagation delay is two microseconds. And the number of hops in our path is equal to six, which is kind of a, a typical number for, for a lot of internet data um, or a lot of uh, inter links over the internet, paths over the internet. So I've got a, a graph here and uh, we'll sort of go, we'll go through it slowly to just explain exactly what it's showing. So on the y-axis, we have delay in seconds. On the x-axis, we have packet size in terms of kilobytes. So we've taken our ND, our number of data bits, our website or our web page, which is 956 kilobytes. And we divide it into a certain number of packets and the size of each individual packet is given on the, on the x-axis. And so basically, as you increase K, as you increase the number of packets that we use, it makes you go to the left on this plot. So some of these lines are a little bit hard to see, so I'm, I'll, I'll highlight them in uh, just using different colors. So let's start with, the, with this blue line, and I'll, I'll just go a little bit bigger on my, my ink here. So this blue line basically represents the time it takes to trans to deliver the file if we do the whole file transfer. If we take the whole web page and we send it to the first router, the router takes that whole file, CRC checks it, then sends the whole file to the next router and so on. So the kind of the slowest possible delivery method. And if we do that, the um the web page arrives and gets CRC checked at our destination after you know almost half a second. Now let's say we divide things into packets. So if I use green, let's use green to represent the time where the very first packet is CRC checked and can be used by the destination. If we start over here, that green dot is where our packet size is basically equal to the whole message. So at this point, whoops. At this point, K is equal to one. Now, as we increase the number of packets that we use, we go in the left direction on the packet size. So as we increase K, our packet size decreases. And the time, I'm just sort of tracing over the, the line here just so you can see it. And this green line that I, I've traced over basically represents the um, time it takes to deliver our first packet. And as we can see, as we decrease our packet size, the time it takes to deliver that first packet goes down to a very, very small number. So what's going on here? Well, we've got on the previous slide, the time for the delivery of the first packet is equal to the number of hops L multiplied by tau plus the size of our packet. And our packet is equal to the number of overhead bits plus the total number of data bits divided by K, all divided by 
the data rate r. And so basically, as we move to the left on this plot, we're increasing the number of packets we use because our, our and, and the size of our packets are, are shrinking as a result. And as we increase k, we can see basically that this term is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And as a result, this green line basically decays down to a, a very, very small number. Now, using a, a second color, let's say red, we can now show, we can also plot the time it takes for our last packet to be delivered. And this red line starts out at exactly the same place as the green, goes down, but it ends up leveling off and in fact starts to increase after a while as we make our, our packets smaller. And so what's going on here? Well, again, if you refer back to the previous slide, um, the time to for the, the last packet to be released is equal to the time for the first packet plus k minus one times the packet duration, which is n naught plus nd over k divided by r. And so as we move to the left on this plot, as we use smaller and smaller packets, basically k grows because we're using more packets. And in this second term, Sure enough, we have something here that will get smaller as we increase k, but we're also, we also have a term out front that is gonna increase. And so what happens is we've got sort of um, competing effects. As we increase k, one term gets smaller, but the other term gets bigger. And so intuitively, what's going on here? Well, you know, as we, um, chop our data into more and more pieces as we make our packet smaller and smaller. We do reduce our packet size because we're reducing the information payload of the um, contained in those data packets. However, the amount of overhead contained in each of the packet re packets remains the same. So we have 160 bits of overhead in our packets. And if we start out with you know, 7 million information bits in our payload, and we start to chop that into smaller and smaller pieces, we're gonna get more and more efficient transmission. However, once we start to introduce, once we start to make our packets so small that the information payload starts to become comparable to the number of overhead bits that we have, which occurs, you know, basically in this region down here, then we've got maybe 160 bits of overhead and you know a couple hundred bits of information and then as we go even smaller we could have 160 bits of overhead and then maybe only 10 or 20 bits of information what starts to happen is that the the waste of sending those overhead bits starts to swamp out the benefit of quicker delivery time with smaller packets and as a result the delivery the overall delivery time starts to increase. And so to step back from this plot, it's basically saying that, you know, there's a, a sweet pot spot in terms of your packet size. You wanna make your packet sizes small so that the routers don't have to wait a huge amount of time before they can CRC check and start that parallel transmission. But you don't wanna make them so small that the overhead bits in the packets um, become large compared to the number of information bits um, you're sending in those packets because then you're basically just taking all your time and you're sending a, a bunch of unnecessary overhead.